So we're still near the beginning of notes number 22 on conjugate operators. And I started talking about uh, the, as an example, of uh, an operator and its conjugate zero padding and its conjugate truncation. And so uh, I showed you the illustration of this um, and the matrix form for uh, zero padding and for zero padding here, and then the matrix form for uh, truncation. And um, uh, I just wanted to note that it's very good to uh, keep truncation in mind because this is what's happening whenever we take data in the real world. <clears throat> we might be doing a fantastic job of, uh, of taking data, um, but you know, real, um, real seismic wave fields and other, uh, other kinds of physical uh, measurements in, um, well, physical phenomena in the, in, in the world, they go on forever. But our data measurements do not. And so every data set has already effectively had this uh, truncation um, operator applied to it. And uh, as you uh, realize, there's also truncation uh, at uh, what would be negative time here. Okay, So we get truncation before we start taking data. Um, and then no matter how good our data are, we eventually stop taking data, and we have thus truncation of our phenomena afterwards. So it's worth keeping track of what um, truncation and also zero padding really are, because uh, they, um, they're fundamental to every piece of data that we have. Uh, here's another example, causal integration, which we explored in 706. Um, and you can see that. Uh, you can achieve that. Um, here, for simplicity, uh, we're showing the, uh, the causal integration matrix as a, a square matrix. So we're saying that the output uh, has a number of samples ny, and that's the same as the number of samples nx in the input x. Uh, so then we can easily represent this as a square matrix. And um, you can see what's happening here. Uh, you know, eventually, say for the third, uh, you know, y sub three, um, we would be taking x one plus x two plus x three plus zero, um, and so we would be working our way down and uh, uh, and integrating all the way. You know, this this integration has no normalization, no damping. Uh, you take the transpose uh, uh, of it. What do you have? Well, uh, here's a representation of the uh, Causal integration, right? It's got ones along the diagonal, and uh, and in, in it's lower triangular. Got it's got one everywhere, including the diagonal. It's got zero in the upper triangle above the diagonal. You transpose that, and of course, then it's upper triangular, still ones along the diagonal. And uh, so, what is this? Well, this is anti-causal integration. Okay, so the transpose, uh, it's you know. I suppose uh, the uh, the inverse of uh, of integration ought to be uh, differentiation, uh, but the transpose is uh, something else. It's anti-causal integration. Ah, the Fourier transform. All right. So here's the uh, uh, summation form of the uh, of the simple uh, Fourier transform. Uh, complex input x at uh, time j. And uh, complex output uh, Fourier transform of x um, y at frequency i, frequency index i. So j is the time index, i is the frequency index. Um, we're not saying anything here about the uh, length of um, of, uh, uh, of of them, but uh, what I'm going to show you here assumes that they're. That we're ha we have is the same number of frequency samples as we do um, as we do uh, uh, time samples, for instance. Um, and so, following uh, what we developed for the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT in seven hundred six, um, we have uh, we're going to do our Fourier transform in place. So, the uh, the input has the same length as the output. Um, 
and we, we know there's lots of convenient reasons for choosing that. And then uh, if you remember the uh, matrix W, which uh, accomplished our DFT, okay? Um, and another thing I want you to remember is that uh, uh, when we derive the FFT, it is algebraically, mathematically uh, exactly the same as the DFT. So whatever, whatever properties we find for the DFT, it's also going to be true of our FFT, which is also brilliantly fast. Uh, you remember that whole argument. So um, uh, you know we're looking at the, of course, the the FFT. You can't put it so easily into matrix form. So this is the DFT, and uh, you remember the the W Fourier transform matrix, uh, which is uh, you know ones at the top in the left side, and then uh, e to the uh, i omega zero. Um, E to the uh, what is it uh, j um, uh, j i omega zero and I've I've put big dots over these i's to tell you that that this is an imaginary exponent to e here throughout. <coughs> uh, so yeah, my choice here of uh, the index for y was not very good. Okay, that's a that's a uh, that's just the index on the frequency index. These i's in here. Are the um, uh, are are the square root of minus one? What's omega zero? Uh, that's uh, uh, whatever you select as your. Um, um, let's see. Is that is that going to be the frequency? Um, I think that's the frequency uh, uh, interval. So the frequency at uh, y of i is going to be the index i times omega zero. I think that's. I think that's what it is, um, and of course these ones just result from the same e to the uh, i i j times uh, the square root of minus one times omega zero. So uh, if you pull out your seven hundred six notes, you'll see this in the same form. Now, let's uh, instead of simply taking the transpose, let's take the conjugate transpose. Um, and so here's the uh, conjugate transpose to what I had up there, where we just take the con complex conjugate of uh, each element of the matrix in addition to its, uh, its transpose. So here it's e to the minus i times omega 0. Okay, so That's the way to take a, the conjugate of a uh, complex conjugate of, a, of an Euler exponential. And uh, you can write this out in, uh, in summation form. Uh, so now uh, x at time index j, uh, and I'm putting a hat over it to uh, uh, to indicate well maybe this is just an estimate is equal to um, uh, summing over uh, all the time uh, uh, indices uh, uh, all the frequency indices i okay there it is right uh, e to the minus the uh, square root of minus one. Uh, that i, which has a big dot over it, um, times omega zero times the index i times the index j, uh, and that uh, exponential times uh, y i. And you remember that that exponential is basically um, um, the Euler exponential boils down to cosine of um, uh, omega zero i j. Uh, plus, uh, 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 in this case, minus uh, i sine omega zero index i j. Um, now, uh, uh, and and as I explained before, when we take the conjugate transpose, uh, and so really what I'm revealing here is that when we when we've taken these transposes. Uh, you know, say for causal integration, or uh, or for zero padding, or for uh, cross correlation and and convolution. When well, whenever, whenever we've taken those transposes, we've actually been taking the conjugate transpose. Uh, but since our matrices were uh, our operators were real, we ignored the fact that we uh, were also doing uh, the complex conjugate. Now uh, here, you know, the elements of the matrix are uh, complex numbers, and so. Um, we're going to explicitly denote that by instead of saying uh, W transpose, we say W prime. Okay. Um, 
and uh, uh, we look at this form. You know, there's the uh, uh, the Fourier transform, and there's this conjugate transpose of the Fourier transform. But wait, that conjugate transform is precisely the inverse discrete Fourier transform. Nothing in, in the least about it, different about it. It's exactly algebraically perfectly the same. So the conjugate transpose of W is its inverse. OK, now, uh, Clairbout here is blithely ignoring the scale factor. OK? You might look at this and say, well, where's the scale factor? And remember, uh, uh, Clairbout, uh, uh, he cheats first by saying the forward Fourier transform, uh, if you remember back at 706, the forward Fourier transform uh, has no scale factor, and he applies the entire scale factor on the uh, inverse uh, Fourier transform. And again, all this about the, uh, the conjugate transpose being exactly the inverse, well, there's still no scale factor applied. Okay? So uh, as, as Clairbout usually does, he's totally ignoring the, uh, the scale factor. Um, so just be aware of that, but that, that doesn't diminish the importance of this, uh, of this uh, uh, observation. Um, so the, uh, uh, the conjugate transpose of W is its inverse, which means by definition that W applied to W prime is equal to I. Okay? And thus, right, uh, our x hat, our estimate of x, is actually x. We are actually getting back to the original series x there. And this is perfect, uh, mathematically correct. You know, there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no error in here. There's no approximation whatsoever. Um, OK, I, you know, I told you he leaves out the scale factor, but um, that's, that's it. It's, uh, uh, and this is why uh, the Fourier transform is used so much in inversion. It's used so much in processing. Um, it's used so much to derive, um, you know, wave equation solutions and, and everything else. Um, it's this uh, e this perfect equivalence between the conjugate transpose and the inverse is an absolutely beautiful property that uh, you will find very few places, uh, but. Practically everything we've done in 706 and 757 is reliant on what we've set up and, and the, uh, uh, the Fourier theorems that we uh, introduced at the very beginning of 706. Um, and uh, you know we're relying on something that is extremely robust here. Um, this is why we, we rely so much on the Fourier transform, uh, because of among many other properties, such as linearity, of this uh, inverse uh, being the same as the conjugate transpose. Uh, now, um, uh, why, don't, why don't we just distribute the scale factor into the matrix? You'd still, uh, uh, you'd still, you know, have you uh, the inverse would still invert the scale factor, and yeah. and. Uh, Yeah, but the, the, the conjugate transpose would, would, not, uh, uh, would not invert the scale factor the way it has to be. So, um, uh, well, let me think about that. Because each time, each time we're basically dividing by, by n, big n, you know, the number of samples. So uh, maybe it would work. Maybe it would work. If, it was, if you left it on the outside, like if you go up just a little bit, you moved that over to the y side, you would have also been moving the 1 over n to the other side, so multiplying by n, so they would cancel. Yeah, yeah. Huh. If you put it inside there, then it wouldn't. I don't right, distributing it, yeah, distributing the scale factor into, uh, into this might, might work. Because it's, it's uh, dividing each time, so the transpose still works. You know, basically dividing each each uh, <coughs> each coefficient of big W by n, capital N, which would be the number of samples in in the input and output. 
So, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, <coughs> I could see your point. Maybe it would work. But I guess it just doesn't really matter in the end. That's Clarabout's position. I mean, he doesn't even show it, right? Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, when you go to, to code it up, then that's where you're faced, oh, yeah, Clarabout didn't cover this. What do I do? You know? It just shows the, the focus that, that, that Claire Bout and I have on, on phase and timing and shape of the wave field over its absolute amplitude, you know, which uh, as uh, um, uh, I'm sure Joe realizes that's kind of a pain to deal with because he's actually trying to assess amplitude. OK, <clears throat> now. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this means that the inverse, uh, the inverse uh, FFT is also the conjugate transpose of the uh, forward FFT. And, um, you know, and we don't even need to show that because we already showed that, that the FFT and its inverse are perfect representations of the, uh, um, uh, of the, of the DFT. Uh, but uh, of course, you go to implement this, and even before you're fa you're wondering about the scale factor, you were faced with the fact that the FFT requires data that's uh, some power of two, two to the power of n long, and we usually have less than some two n, and uh, you know, like your data set is has three thousand or three thousand and one samples uh, from your uh, in your shock gathers at uh, Santa Medio. And uh, the next power of two is uh, what four oh nine six. So uh, what do you do? You know, you pad with zeros, and this may be happening. Uh, you know, when you're when you're Fourier transforming in MATLAB or or OpenDetect, um, uh, or or uh, uh, ViewMat. This is happening behind the scenes, and you never really know. Uh, although uh, at least the BP filter in uh, ViewMat tells you. Um, when you're, uh, you know, it asks you, you know, how, how much do you want to pad? Do you want to just, you know, you want to uh, just go to one, you know, the, the first, uh, you want to go to just the first uh, power of two, or you want to go to the second one? That's the default. Uh, you know, so you're padding by a factor of two as well. Um, uh, so view mat is, that number is the next power of two? No, that's the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you you, you go to the you go to the next power of two, and if you and the the factor you enter, you enter there is is how many times that you want you want that to be. I, I thought it was you know add like that, it said two, so I put in a hundred. You know, put in ten. It was pretty slow then, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> ten was ten was pretty slow. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I was thinking, you know, why don't we just put in something much larger? Yeah, it's not the number of samples. It's it's how much. How many times the the original length we are going to use? I thought two seemed a little low. Uh, yeah, yeah. Two more samples would be Insane. pretty useless, right? Yeah. That's why I brought that up yesterday. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I didn't understand what you were getting at. More sense to pad with more zeros than two. Right, right. And I, I, I was saying, I, I was thinking factor of two. That you know, that's usually enough. But not always. It's okay. true. Okay, so uh, you know we decide on some number of zeros we want to pad it with, and maybe it's going to be uh, you know uh, ten thousand times the original length. And that's okay. Um, we just put that into here's our here's our our uh, 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 input x. You know however long that is. You know it's uh, short of some power of two, and uh, and here's a uh, a zero padding. Uh, Matrix multiplication, which is an identity matrix, uh, which is going to be nx uh, by nx, and then um, we have an nx uh, column by uh, by some number uh, row zero matrix that we uh, that we stack onto the bottom of that uh, identity matrix, and then we hit it with w, okay, um, and in in uh, all of the routines that you use. That W has the uh, scale factor built in. Um, so the uh, and that gives us the output, 
uh, which now has a longer length. Uh, y has a longer length than uh, uh, than x because uh, it's been padded, and it, and that length is going to be a power of two to be able to go through w. Um, well, not to be able to go through w itself, but to be able to go through uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the fast Fourier transform algorithm. Okay. Now, uh, uh, how do we find the conjugate? Well, note, uh, you know, the, the, here's the way it works, right? Uh, from matrix, uh, from linear algebra, we have our input. We we have a right associative uh, matrix multiplication operation here. So the first thing that acts on x is the uh, the zero padding. And then uh, w is also right associative, so uh, uh, that then acts on the result of the uh, of the zero padding. Okay, uh, so here's uh, uh, here's some uh, matrix C that is uh, the product of of matrix A acting on matrix B. All right, and if you want to transpose that whole matrix, you know what happens to uh, to A and B? Well, here's here's uh, you know, from linear algebra, how it works, uh, you end up applying a transpose first. Okay, it's right, right associative, and then the result of a transpose applied to your input um, uh, is acted upon by b transpose. So, you know, in the forward uh, uh, process, uh, uh, b acts first, and then a acts on the result. In the transpose process uh, or conjugate transpose process. Uh, a transpose x first, and then B transpose x on the result. Okay, so uh, so here's what uh, what we what we do, and 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 the codes all do exactly this. Okay, we have our x hat. Okay, which is our uh, our uh, um, data uh, uh, column vector, and uh, here's our uh, uh, our estimate of the data column vector, and here's our uh, our uh, you know, former output y, which we're first going to act on by um, uh, w uh, conjugate transpose, which is basically the inverse FFT. Okay, and then we have the transpose of the uh, of the zero padding, which, uh, as you recognize now, is a truncation operator. Uh, you know, it's the zero that big long uh, zero uh, matrix uh, to the right now of the identity matrix, and so that's a a, uh, a, a truncation operator, and uh, and so what we what we get by that uh, um, you know little uh, little uh, theorem in, in linear algebra is that uh, when we fed it into the Fourier transform we had zero padding before uh, forward FFT and then we have truncation after inverse FFT and that's how it all can work. Right, it's sort of obvious now, but uh, uh, you know this is the the math of it now. Um, so uh, uh, now now also we might uh, uh, we might be doing a um, um, we might be doing a uh, uh, well at least in the Fourier domain we have. Um, uh, in the Fourier domain, we're using uh, complex uh, data, uh, but our uh, uh, so so y is a complex, uh, you know, has complex values. But x, well, that really has just real values, right? Um, so let's set up a uh, um, uh, let let's set up a a, a, a complex uh, data structure. Um, which has the real part in the as the top of the column vector, and then instead of interleaving uh, um, the, uh, the the imaginary samples, we'll just put all the imaginary samples down below. So, you know, this this is a very long this is a twice as long column vector now. With um, it's got the real part of, of y first, and then it starts all over again. And there's uh, uh, many more. Um, you know many more levels, which are all the imaginary parts of uh, of the y samples, okay, and uh, uh, so in the forward Fourier transform, what we're actually doing is we're concocting this uh, we're concocting this this uh, uh, 
this input vector to the complex Fourier transform, where we're taking x, which is real only, and we're taking that as the real part of the uh, of the uh, of the trans of the uh, uh, the real part of a of a complex uh, uh, column vector, and and we're we're basically padding it with zero for the zero um, imaginary part of the complex vector. Okay, so so there's two zero paddings in here, one in time and one in in uh, in by setting the imaginary part to zero. So there's a zero padding there. There's a um, there's a uh, um, um, uh, and and uh, um, and there's a uh, 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 a zero padding for time, and then we can push it through the uh, uh, we can push it through the the um, uh, the Fourier transform. So that's what we're really doing here. Kind of hidden that before. Um, and then, and so y is uh, complex, and so really that's what we're feeding to, you know, in the in the transpose operation. That's really what we're feeding to the uh, uh, the conjugate transpose w for the inverse uh, FFT, right? So we got the real, we got the imaginary part below it, um, you know, all lined up in one column. And uh, then here's the time uh, uh, truncation, and then uh, we get the uh, because we uh, we've kept everything uh, um, symmetric enough to be uh, all real, right? You remember how that works. Um, we get zero on the imaginary part of the uh, of the inverse uh, for x hat, and and then there's our real one, and we can truncate that, right? Um, by just uh, ignoring the uh, the imaginary part and extracting the real part. So there's really two. Uh, there's two pads going on in here, and there's two truncations going on. Um, so uh, just to just to make sure that's uh, that's uh, uh, clear. All right. Now I, I want to explain uh, uh, why we're going to pay so much attention to these conjugate transposes. Um, uh, it's kind of a hint only that uh, the inverse. Uh, Fourier transform is the the same as the conjugate transpose Fourier transform. So we've got some kind of modeling operation. We take an input x, we operate on it with a with a linear operator b, and we get an output y. And we wish to define the inversion operation. So you know, in usual fashion, we would begin by forming the normal equations, right? So we would pre-multiply uh, both sides of the equation by uh, B conjugate transpose B prime, so we got B prime applied to Y. We have B prime applied to B applied to X. Okay, and uh, then we can solve for uh, for X by finding you know no matter what B is, uh, B prime B is uh, square, um, and uh, so at least you know it works out uh, 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 formulaically, right? So we have uh, uh, we have the inverse of the quantity, and we're not saying yet how you know whether we can do that inverse, but uh, we'll try it. We have the inverse of the quantity b prime b, that square matrix, uh, and that's applied to uh, b prime, which is applied to y. We've seen this before talking about tomography. Okay, and so then what's on the right hand side now is b prime b inverse applied to b prime b. So obviously that goes to uh, to the identity matrix, and uh, so then uh, we can just drop the identity matrix and uh, and isolate uh, x on the left side here. Just switch the sides around, and so our our uh, our normal equation solution is b prime b inverse uh, applied to b prime applied to the data y. Uh, and as we saw in tomography, we could make an estimate by back projection. Which is simply uh, x hat is um, uh, now so that's the estimate of the uh, of the model now uh, or the estimate of the input is equal to b prime applied to y very simple okay now now making that estimate you realize that 
b prime and b inverse differ only by this factor, b prime b inverse. Okay. Now, now you're probably thinking, but that's you know that's where all the work is. Everything's happening in there. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so hold that thought. Okay. Any uh, first of all, any truncation, aliasing, or noise inherent in b also appears in b prime. Okay. So, so just as we've uh, seen, uh, you know, zero padding, truncation, and also uh, uh, aliasing, we'll look more at stretches and shrinks uh, and that sort of thing. The noise is also in, uh, that's in B is in B prime. So B prime, B prime ha really has a lot in it. It's doing a lot. Okay. So maybe this factor here, uh, you know, B prime B inverse, uh, maybe it doesn't have to do so much. But this is a you know B could be a whole process, right? It's, it this could be B could be you know fourteen different uh, operators strung together, and including noise, right? We're not saying yet how complex B is. Wouldn't the noise be in data? Um, but isn't there also you know look at think about the simple uh, convolution or, or deconvolution problem, right? There's also going to be noise in the uh, um, in the Earth reflectivity series, yeah. and uh, and there's certainly uncertainty in it. There's certainly variance in it. So uh, uh, all of that is built into B, right? You got yeah, you got more noise in X. You got more noise in Y. Okay, but uh, uh, there's plenty that's uh, that's in B as well. And usually plenty of noise. <clears throat> okay. So uh, uh, there's this question hanging out here: How close is B prime to B inverse? B conjugate transpose to B inverse. And many examples suggest that once we have a program for modeling, okay, um, few changes are needed to to program the con the conjugate transpose. I'm sorry. So, so really, what, what I'm addressing here is how easy is it to uh, to get the uh, the conjugate transpose? Okay, we'll we'll leave this uh, you know verification of, of how close the inverse is to the conjugate transpose. That's another that's another question. But uh, the question we're going to work on here for a second is uh, um, is uh, uh, okay. Maybe maybe we say it's easy to to take our modeling program. And make a conjugate transpose program. How do we tell if we have the correct pair? You know, we've we've correctly made the conjugate transpose. Maybe we also have to, you know, be able to validate the uh, um, or verify that uh, we've got the correct modeling program too. Okay. So uh, you know, in generating data, we have y equals b x, and then uh, in estimating a model. We have x hat equals b prime y. So now let's uh, let's just form uh, um, uh, um, let's form this uh, 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 this uh, this is really just a big uh, in a set of inner products here, and uh, we have uh, y prime. Okay, so that would be uh, uh, an estimated. Uh, well, actually, that's. Uh, Y conjugate transpose applied to B X okay is equal to uh, uh, Y conjugate transpose applied to B and uh, that result applied to X okay so uh, and really what you what we've done is we've we've just applied you know we've we've taken um, um, B X and we've uh, we've equated it to itself. And pre-multiplied, uh, um, pre-multiplied both sides by y conjugate transpose. Okay. Uh, why would we do something like that, right? These obviously are equal because we we are what we started with was was b x equal b x. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Well, let's do a little uh, uh, manipulation here. Let's take the uh, uh, the 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 transpose of um, 
of uh, of wa of um, you know we can we can transpose what's inside here if we so long as we we transpose what's inside and then we retranspose it when we come outside of the uh, when we come outside of the the uh, parentheses. So what's inside here now is uh, the transpose is b prime y, right? We reverse the order. We take the uh, the transpose, right? So we've done that, and then we take the transpose coming out, and that's the same as what's above. Again, you know, it seems pointless, right? This all should be mathematically equivalent to one. <clears throat> you know, it's like saying x equals x. Big deal, okay? Um, but that's that's actually just the point, you know. Um, now you go and you you implement it. You you take your data, you take your codes, and you actually implement it. <coughs> you take some some you know really any data, uh, or or non data, random uh, x and y, and you compute b x, okay, and that gives you uh, y, um, and you compute uh, b prime y. And you take its transpose, and that gives you x. Okay, and so now you take that that resulting now computed, not algebraic, but computed, right? You take the computed uh, uh, estimate of, of y. You take uh, y prime, and you take uh, and you multi and you dot product that with y, and um, uh, the the estimate y. And you take uh, x prime, its estimate from here, and uh, you dot product it with x. Okay, so y prime y tilde uh, is is should of course be equal to x tilde prime x. Okay, and if uh, if uh, if y dot uh, y tilde is equal to uh, uh, x dot x tilde. Then you know your programs are correct. Okay, I mean, of course, algebraically, this is this is uh, you know it's it's like a null case, but when you're actually writing computer programs, um, <clears throat> you know these should prove out to, uh, as Clairbout says, the sixth digit. You know, and and these days it ought to prove out to the twelfth digit, but maybe that's asking uh, asking a bit much. Um, so there, there should be exact equivalency here, just like the algebra demands, uh, and that's a great way of of testing that you've got the right modeling program, and then what you really have is you know your B prime is really the transpose conjugate transpose of it, um, you know, and if you try this for uh, you know your FFT and uh, uh, and and uh, inverse FFT, this is what should happen, okay. And I believe it will with with mine, uh, but should, you know, for uh, truncation, for um, um, for uh, uh, match filtering, uh, for all of it, it should work. Any of these uh, any of these operators, all the operators together, it should work to the sixth digit. Okay. Now let's look at some uh, uh, stretching, uh, you know, some some geometric operations, um, you know, basically deformational operations. Um, you know what we've what we've looked at so far, uh, um, you know, they they haven't uh, they haven't uh, they they've been the kind of operation, you know, even the Fourier transform that. Um, is you know maybe it's going from one axis to another, but it's not, it's not um, you know playing with the axis. It's with an axis itself, okay. And these stretches and deformations uh, um, are uh, uh, well. We'll see just how useful they are, and and they kind of represent a different class of problem. So uh, uh, the the topic here is really mapping and interpolation. <clears throat> so consider these uh, these two examples. We have a stretch of a of a wave in time. You know, it's uh, it's the input is is negative for a while. You get to point, you know, say time a, and it starts to ramp up till time b. Then it flattens out till time c, and then it it, it uh, plunges back negative again. 
uh, to time d, and then it's uh, it's it maintains that uh, <coughs> that uh, 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 that level after that. The output of a stretch, at least a centered stretch, ought to look like this, right? So a uh, time a is much a prime is much earlier than a. Uh, b is is earlier than uh, b prime is earlier than b. Maybe uh, if it's a centered stretch like this, uh, c prime is later than c, and d prime is much later than than d. Okay, you know, so maybe we've stretched this by a factor of fifty percent or something. Uh, the input of a shrink might be the same wave field, and we compress it. Okay, so uh, here. Uh, you know, maybe a is the same time as a prime, but b prime is less than b. C is uh, c prime is more or less than c, and d prime is way less than d. Okay, in time, <clears throat> but keeping the same amplitudes. Uh, of course, you know these uh, these don't preserve energy, right? Um, you know the the uh, the shrunken uh, wave field has. Uh, has uh, the compressed wave field here has less energy in it than the than the original. The uh, the stretched wave field has more energy in total than the original wave field. Uh, now let's let's see what happens with discrete sampled data. Okay, like in the uh, FFT lab uh, code, we're going to represent each sample with a a ball and bar. You know that's either at a negative value or a positive value. So here's that original wave. Uh, the sample's A, B, C, D, and there's the one that comes after D in the, in the original. Now we project from the, uh, the input, right? And so A projects to this earlier sample here at A prime, and B uh, projects to B prime. OK, that's fine. Uh, C projects to a later sample. Uh, and D projects to a way later sample, and there's these samples in between. W what do we do with them? You know, projecting from the input, we're we're not, we're not really saying how we're uh, um, how we're how we're getting these. We we got to do something with those, otherwise, you know, we're gonna have a completely different wave uh, wavelet. <clears throat> okay, we find it from the uh, the output, right? So we go through. We we set up the output vector and uh, we say all right this sample it's uh, which which uh, uh, which sample of the input is it closest to well that's a so a prime goes there uh, this one here which sample is uh, is it closest to oh that's a again so a prime goes there uh, uh, once more you know this one's closest to b this one's closest to b as well. Now that we go, come to this, the next one, this, that one's closest to C, that one's closest to C, C2, and that one there is closest to D. Okay, so uh, and of course this is the reason why there's more, uh, you know, this this uh, and this is a nearest neighbor uh, interpolation uh, from the uh, output, and uh, uh, but at least we've we've. Found a way to reliably determine all of these samples, which, if we project from the input, you know, we wouldn't know wh where to get them from necessarily. Now, on the uh, on the shrink, uh, okay, there's the same the same wavelet. Um, we project from the uh, the input, and um, uh, oh, in the shrink, uh, both B and C land here on this on this one. Okay, and and this one, well, both D and E land on that one. You know, where do we? You know, which one do we choose, or do we average them? Good question. Okay, uh, in a shrink, finding it from the output. I mean, maybe, maybe that's not much better. Uh, we 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 know exactly what to do to get each one. You know, this one um, is closest to A, and and this one is closest to C, uh, and this one is closest to E. So we got no no problem. You know, finding them, but but then we may wonder, well, what what the heck happened? You know, we lost data here. You know, B went away totally. You know, we lost that. We're we're missing information. D went away totally. We we're missing that one too. Where to go? Well, nowhere. We we dumped we that information. 
uh, finding each point of the output in the input in the in the within the input gives a more stable result. But in the shrink operation, some points do get thrown out. Okay, you know, and, and so uh, how do you account for neighboring points? Well, here's a uh, here's an interpolation scheme. Okay, let's express our stretch as a matrix operation. So uh, obviously, uh, we're going to have if we're stretching the time series. You know, here we have four points of input, and we're going to have um, we're going to have uh, six points of output. So the output has a longer, you know, it's a longer column vector than uh, the, the input. And so the, uh, of course, then we have this rectangular uh, interpolation matrix, okay, and. Um, and and we we uh, we sort of to, to do a stretch, what we do is we we find the approximate diagonal of it, and we populate that diagonal with these uh, ones. Okay, so this is kind of a rectangular representation of an identity matrix, if you will. Okay, um, you know, it can be tricky sometimes. Where exactly do we put that? But there's a you know there's a good solution for it. All right. So, uh, and notice, of course, uh, you know that's where we get the the two representations of B, the two representations of D. That comes from how we populated that diagonal. Okay. Now, to do the uh, the inverse mapping, maybe I should I should shrink this a bit. Um, okay. To do the inverse mapping. Uh, let's uh, so we started with y equals you know the, sh the stretched one y is equal to b times x, and so now we'll get back an x by uh, shrinking, and that's uh, uh, b transpose y. Well, there's b transpose, okay, and uh, now you'll notice that where we had you know only one value in the stretch, now we've got two in the shrink, and those get added together so. Really, we get you know here on the second position instead of b we get two times b, and in the fourth position instead of d we get two times d. Okay, so using the transpose alone, obviously, uh, 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 you know, our estimate of x is not equal to x, not at all. It's uh, quite a different wave. There, there's some similarities, but uh, that's it. Okay. So in the case of a stretch and shrink. Um, we're actually going to want to find a B transpose which is close to B inverse, you know, and 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 uh, you'll see in a moment that that all the time we're needing to do this kind of interpolation. A lot of processes. I mean, think back to seven hundred six and the the um, the omega stretch, right? Uh, many pro which which in some cases is a shrink. Okay, many processes need a good B inverse, an inverse stretch, and and it's going to be applied and inverted repeatedly as an iterative process. Um, so it's really important that we have a, a smooth and predictable and and uh, very parsimonious uh, um, inverse stretch. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, uh, you know. It, here it's actually useful to go through the normal equations and 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 find a uh, an inverse stretch, you know, using our good old uh, our, our good old methods. Um, so uh, uh, the solution, you know, you form the normal equations. So here's the forward problem: y equals b x, and uh, forming the normal equations to invert for x, we have x is equal to b transpose b inverse uh, times b transpose applied to the stretched data y, right? So that's uh, you know it's easy to get the transpose, but uh, now we have uh, we we're scaling the transpose by this inverse. Okay, uh, let's look at what we got. Uh, can we find this uh, this inverse? So so I'll just uh, you know crunch through. Um, I mean I could have left this as an exercise to the student, but uh, uh, that's not how we're running this class. So uh, uh, you know, here's uh, B transpose, and there's B, and uh, so uh, here's uh, B transpose B now, 
which is a square matrix, and in our case it's four by four. It's uh, you know uh, the square of the size of the of the input, and uh, and notice uh, what's along the diagonal. Uh, and if you think about this uh, for a stretch and shrink, you know starting with this uh, this uh, uh, let me call it single banded uh, you know uh, stretch diagonal. Okay, uh, uh, that's not really a term, but I'll call it that. Um, the uh, uh, the normal equations, if you think about it, are always going to give us a square B transpose B matrix. Okay, and for our interpolation problem, uh, notice that that B transpose B is in fact diagonal, uh, and for this one here, inversion is easy. For the stretch, inversion is easy. Right, uh, so we just take the inverse of, of diagonal elements of B transpose B. Right, we've got one over one, one over two, one over one, one over two, and as you can see, you know that's exactly what we needed to correct to scale the different values of, of our x hat here, and and get us back to our original data. So here's a place where the normal equations uh, work very very well. Okay, now. In general, when B stretches, we can invert B transpose B. It's non-singular. No problem. Very easy. But if B shrinks, uh-oh, uh, then we can't invert B transpose B. It will always be singular. Okay? And why is that? Well, information in X has been lost. Okay? It's gone in the shrink. Okay? Where did those samples go? You know B and, and D. Well, they just went away. Um, so for our uh, for our stretch, you know B transpose B inverse just scales the results of B transpose in this uh, you know normal equation solution. Uh, for our stretch, um, uh, okay. Now we can always find B transpose and. Uh, and even and so we can we can apply it right up here right we no matter what our stretch is or, sh or our shrink you know even if we have a terrible shrink we lose lots of data we can still find B transpose and it gives us an estimate okay um, it, it'll give us an x hat uh, but for um, um, uh, where where B is a uh, is a shrink. Then you know B transpose B is singular, and uh, and we're 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 not going to be able to complete uh, inverting that matrix. Okay, in general, all right. B transpose B expresses a least squares approach with autocorrelation functions on each row centered at the diagonal. Okay, and of course where you're where you've got a shrink, you know it's it's going to be. It's going to be uh, non-singular. It's going to be singular. Okay. So uh, you know, B is n by m. Uh, B transpose is m by n. So B transpose B is n by n. And uh, on the diagonal, uh, you know, here kind of poorly uh, drawn, but on the diagonal, we've got uh, we've got a peak. Uh, hopefully, we might have a singular value. <clears throat> And then off the diagonal we have we have the rest. Okay, at the peaks, you know, we're looking at the autocorrelation of uh, you know some value with itself through the uh, through the shrink and, and uh, stretch process. And off diagonal we have the autocorrelation of a sample with a different with a sample at a different time through that stretch and shrink process. Okay, now ideally, okay. If everything was perfect, you know uh, our uh, autocorrelation along the diagonal at x i uh, uh, comma x i would be one, and the autocorrelation off the diagonal would be zero. But uh, that's the uh, the ideal case. Okay, now this this might all seem kind of useless here, but uh, uh, tomorrow we're going to go into uh, a really useful example of stretch and shrink. Which is the NMO correction, okay? Uh, and of course, there's a kind of NMO correction going on even even you know in the common image gathers, 
uh, even for our um, um, even for our uh, um, um, even for our pre-stack depth migrations. So if we can understand this stretch and shrink, this interpolation and mapping that's going on in our in our imaging, uh, and starting with simple NMO correction, but having being able to apply that to uh, uh, to as fancy a migration as we may have, um, then we're going to be way ahead, uh, especially once we start talking about iterative migration. Um, and uh, uh, you know this continues to be useful. Uh, uh, I'm 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 going to try to come up with a uh, a final lecture on uh, on RTM and uh, and uh, uh, full wave inversion uh, for you guys. And uh, you'll see that that we've got to have stable processes for these uh, stretches and shrinks because um, you know we're going uh, uh, we're stretching. We're effectively doing NMO stretches and shrinks constantly uh, throughout the process, and um, you know if we allow uh, uh, errors, uh, uh, you know, like this to creep in, okay, and our estimates are too far off, then uh, we're in big trouble because we're going to just keep applying it and keep applying it, and the errors will will eventually dominate the whole thing. All right, so. Uh, Simple NMO example of uh, stretching and shrinking uh, tomorrow.